to preach this morning a message I've entitled Overcoming Limitations. Overcoming Limitations. And I early woke up early this morning and felt the fire in my bones today. So how many of you know that when the fire is in my bones, you can throw fuel on that fire by just getting with me? Amen. Just getting right on in there and eating up the word that God has for us today. I want to kind of piggyback and bounce off a little bit of what I taught on on Wednesday night. Those of you that were here Wednesday night, I preached on the cost of the anointing. And the Lord had already been laying this message on my heart. And there were several people who said, you need to just re-preach Wednesday nights. Not several, but a few. A few people said, you just need to re-preach Wednesday nights to Sunday mornings. Well, I'm not going to do that. But if you were here Wednesday night, there may be a few things that you will recognize in this message entitled, Overcoming Limitations. Look with me today at verse number 1. The word says that the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him As king over Israel, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Now once you skip down a few verses and look at verse number 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. But he looks, and people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Everybody say, the Lord looks at the heart. heart. Now say it again. The Lord Lord. looks at my heart. heart. Go on, it says here in the next verse. If you keep reading verse verse number 8, it says, Then Jesse called Abinadad and had him pass in front of Samuel, but Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. He was a shepherd boy. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and he had him brought in. He was glowing with health and he had fine appearance and handsome features. And the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. I want to talk today about overcoming limitations because there is not one of us here in this place today that hasn't faced some type of limitations in our life. Sometimes we are the ones who set limitations on ourselves. We find ourselves saying and thinking things such as, I could never achieve that. Or we say things like, I could never preach like he could preach. Or I could never sing like she can sing. I could never play the piano like he can play the piano. I could never get that promotion at work. And we use this word, I, I, I. I could never be a good parent like they are good parents. And we find ourselves placing limitations on ourselves but not only do we place limitations on ourselves but sometimes people set limitations on us how many of you have ever been limited by somebody else somebody else said no you can't do that no you'll never be good enough for that no you'll never achieve that they may say things like this he's too young to be a pastor of a church he's too old to teach a class he she's worthless she'll never amount to anything she'll be just like her mama was she'll be just like her parents were if you will he can't do anything right he'll never succeed he'll never make it anywhere in life he'll never get off those drugs he'll never stop this or start that sometimes people place limitations on us not only do we place limitations on ourselves at times and not only do people place limitations on us but sometimes demon possessed people place limitations on us I'll tell you in the ministry I've found many 
many people who want to who wanna operate in another spirit other than the Holy Spirit and put limitations on you. I've even seen churches get a little bit demonic when it comes to that. They begin to say stuff like this. Well, we've tried it and it didn't work, so why try it again? They'll say, they'll say things like this. Well, there'll never be revival again. There'll never be a move of God. You're just wasting your time. People don't want a move of God. They want 20 minute, 30 minute sermons. If you study the mega churches, they all let out in less than an hour and you keep your people for three hours. You'll never grow a church that way. Get behind me, Satan. I'm not interested in running people through a feeding trough. I'm interested in a move of God. I, I'll tell you today, sometimes demon possessed people will set limitations on you. They'll say things like, they'll, they'll come to you and listen, I'm going to tell you a negative and a critical spirit is a spirit from the pit of hell. You need to get away from those people who are always complaining and griping and being negative and if you are one of them people you need to repent and let the joy we sing about today fill your heart because Jesus said the fruit of the spirit is love joy joy comes when the spirit's in you not negativity or a cri- I told you there's some fire shut up in my bones today demon possessed people will place limitations on you well you'll 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 they'll, they'll say things like you know you'll you you might you might as well just give up on them they'll never change come on church You'll never see Little Rock saved. It's too lost. It's too big of a project. That's a limitation. Listen, you may limit yourself. Other people may limit you. Even the devil in hell may put limitations on you, but never limit God. I said never limit God because we serve a big God. I dream big because I serve a big God. I have big dreams because He's a big God. I believe for big things because He is anybody in this house because He's a big God. There's nothing too hard for him and there's nothing I'm going to limit myself from seeing him do through my life and my ministry and our church because he's a big God don't be a small dreamer don't think small you serve a mighty God a big God you got to rise above your limitations you see the word limit or the word limitation means this it means the point beyond which something cannot Proceed. Write that down if you're taking notes. The word limit or limitation means the point beyond which something cannot proceed. I used to really enjoy playing paintball and, and uh, still do when I get the opportunity. But matter of fact, I've been, I've been, my right leg's been aching for about 12 days. The last two days it's felt pretty good. But for, for almost two weeks it's been giving me a lot of trouble. That's because I have a rod from my knee down to my ankle. And that's from a paintball in. Injury. That's at the barn swings on a paintball day, jumping out of a barn. But 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 you know, I, I used to love playing paintball, and I, our youth pastor, I was his youth pastor, and we played paintball several times together. And I remember one time we were playing out in Ozark, Missouri, and uh, man, this field was amazing. I may have shared part of this story with you before, but but this paintball field, it was it was massive. It isn't like these little arenas they have now that are just all boxed in. This you could go all over. It had woods. It had school buses you could hide in it had towers it had everything out there and uh, and there was a fence there was a barbed wire fence that surrounded it and that was the limits that were placed on you and I remember that day taking several of our our teenagers boys and girls to play paintball and man I was just taking them off one at a time I mean nobody was seeing me hitting me and just one at a time I'm bringing them down they're just coming down wham 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 and it was kind of like me against all of them I'm just taking them all, all down. Even my own team members, man, I'm hitting them with a paintball. That, Cause that's what youth pastors do, you see. And and they're coming down one after another, and all of a sudden I hear that whistle blow, and I think there can't be any of them left. I've taken them all out. I know they're all gone. I've taken them all out. And I begin to walk in to where the to where you to where everybody meets. And as I was coming, I come to a fence. I come to that barbed wire fence, but I was on the wrong side of it. Some point in that paintball game, my mask had become foggy, and I went went through that fence without even knowing I had crossed over that fence. So everybody I was shooting at when I was on the other side of that fence, it didn't even count for a point because I was out of limits. I was out of boundaries. I'll tell you, I've never liked limits. I don't like when people put limitations on me. Reminds me reminds me when I first started driving, my first car was a Pontiac Firebird. It was black. If Alonda's in here somewhere or another, she'll remember it. And uh, I think she's the only one in here that might remember that. But I grew up in Mount 
Mountain Home, Arkansas. At that time, Mountain Home was probably, when I started driving, probably about seven or 8,000 people, and about 10,000 of those people were retirees, if you know what I'm talking about. 7,000 people there, 10,000 were people that had retired from Chicago. I'll tell you, nobody retires and move north, they move south. And Mountain Home, Mountain Home, where I'm from, is a retirement village. That means everybody drives real slow, everybody just takes their time, nobody's headed to work, nobody's got anything to do. If, listen, I don't care if it's Friday night, they're out for a Sunday afternoon drive. If it's Monday morning, they're out for a Sunday. But here comes me, the 16-year-old, with his new black fire, uh, uh, Pontiac Firebird. Londa, you'll remember it. And here I come, and I don't like being told you got to go slow. I don't like being told. I'm a new driver. I want to speed. I want to go fast. I want to I want to take this sports car and use it. And that first year, Londa, you may remember this. I had to ask Crystal to remind me how many times I was pulled over. But my first year of driving, I was pulled over 25 times. My first year, I kid you not, 25 times. But here's the good news. I only got one speeding ticket in 25 times. And the reason is I kept a get-out-of-jail-free Monopoly card in my car. And when they pulled me over, I'd pull out that card and say, please give me a break. And usually they would laugh at it and they'd give me a break. But I'll tell you, when I started driving, the last thing I wanted to see is when I want to go 65 to see a speed limit sign that says 35. Anybody ever been through Damascus, Arkansas, where it goes from 60 down to 40? Anybody got a ticket in Damascus, Arkansas? My wife got a ticket uh, last year, I think, around this time uh, in Damascus, Arkansas. I'm telling you, friend, limitations are everywhere around us and, and and, and, and if we're not careful, they will cause us to be paralyzed in what God has called us to be and what God has called us to do. Can you say amen? Because all around, there are circumstances that will come up in your life. There are situations. As I said, there are people and even our own selves that will try to put limit signs on saying you can't be that or you can't do that. But this morning, we read about a man named David who had to overcome many limitations Limitations in his life to get to where God had called him. The first thing that he had to overcome, number one, is that Jesse, Jesse, his father, did not think that David had king potential. Everyone say king potential. That's right, Jesse didn't think that his son David had king potential. Matter of fact, the Bible says that when they had the ordination service to choose the next king of Israel, Jesse didn't even bring David. He didn't even bring his youngest son. Why? He did not think he had king potential. Now think about this day for Jesse and his sons. A prophet of the Lord has come and knocked on your door. It's one regular day like any other day, but this day there's a knock at the door and you open it and it's Samuel and he's a prophet and the prophet of the Lord says, I've been sent here by God, the creator of heaven and earth. He told me to fill my horn with oil because one of your sons, Mr. Jesse, is about to be anointed the next king of Israel. And he said, I have been sent here to anoint the one that God has chosen. Think about this day for Jesse and his sons. Think about these sons going, wow, one of us, one of us, one of Jesse's boys is going to be anointed the next king of Israel. And Jesse did this. The Bible says says that Jesse, it doesn't tell us necessarily how many sons he had, it says he pulled seven sons right there, seven sons and put them in a line. I believe he pulled the seven best sons that he had and he looked and what he was doing is he was looking at the exterior and he was, he was lining them up thinking this one right here could be a king. I'll never forget one day we bought a flipper house in Seymour, Missouri. Anybody know where Seymour, Missouri is on Highway 60 outside of uh, Springfield, Missouri? Well, it's an Amish community, meaning for for every car you see, you'll see four wagons. Am I telling the truth? I mean, them wagons go down the side of Highway 60. You'll just fly by them, but they live all over. And these are the real Amish folk, man. They, they ain't got power. They got the, they use the windmill for power and all that. And I remember I bought a house there in Seymour. It was a foreclosure, and and uh, and uh, I was I was at a restaurant, and I was thinking, man, it'd be nice if I could find somebody local to paint this house and do some repairs and some minor repairs, just some small things that I don't want to piddle with and 
So, so when I was pulling out of the restaurant, here comes up a buggy. This guy riding on his horse, you know, and got the beard and, you know, the hat. And he's Amish, full Amish. So I just stop. I stop and say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. And, you know, they got that German type accent. And he, he says, yes, sir. And I said, uh, I said hey, would, would you or someone you know want to have a job? I said, I need to hire someone to paint the inside of a house and do some minor works and, uh, work and repairs. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, that will be my dad's decision, but I'm sure we could do it. We'd, we'd love to have the extra money. He said, why don't you come to my house tomorrow morning at a certain time? He showed me how to get, he drew me a map how to get there. So I did. I went and all of a sudden I'm in this Amish farm community and I feel like I've gone back 200, 300 years. I mean, I'm telling you, it's like even the wind wasn't blowing on this farm. I'm t- the dust was still, it was weird. It was, had a weird feel to it, you know. And, uh, and, I, and I walk up and I knock on the door and the mom, the, the woman of the house, she opens the door. I said, I'm here. I have an appointment. I'm supposed to talk to, I believe, maybe your husband about, about somebody in your family to come and do some work at my house. And she said, she said, hang on, uh, just go stand out in the yard and he'll be out in just a minute. So kicked me off the front porch. So I got off the front porch and uh, I went out and stood in the yard and I thought, man, if they don't show up in a hurry, I'm getting out of here. Because I feel I felt like I was in a horror movie there for a minute. I mean, looking around, windmill slowly going. About that time, the, the man, you tell, he was the man, the husband, the father of the house, he comes out. He asked me, what do you need? I said, I need to hire someone. He said, male or female? I said, male. <laughs> and he, he blew this, he, he made a whistle out of his, I mean, he, he blew this sound out of his mouth. And all of a sudden, boys, or not boys, but men, started coming from everywhere. I mean, from the barn, from the house, from the backyard. All of a sudden, I'm standing out in the yard all by myself. Next thing I know, men are coming everywhere. And before I knew it, about 14 men lined up right in front of me, and they lined up oldest to youngest without being told to do so. The youngest was a boy about 11 years old. They went up to the oldest brother, was probably in his upper 20s, maybe even in his 30s, and they're lined up all in front of me. And he says, he says, tell me what kind of projects you have, and then we'll match up the man for the project. So I said, well, I need the inside of my house painted. And I told him the little bit of other stuff. He looks at me and he says, nope, I can't send any of my boys on that. He said, uh, he said, he did. He said, that's a woman's job, painting inside. He said, would you be okay with my daughter painting? I said, I don't care. The price is right. Send her. How old is she? <laughs> and he gets his daughter and he says, I'll tell you what, I'll send my daughter and I'll send my youngest boy to help her and to assist her. But I won't charge you any extra for her. I said, well, how much are we talking? We haven't even talked money yet. And I got all these people standing in front of me. He said, whatever you think they're worth. I'll send the two, you pay for one, you just pay whatever they're worth. That's exactly how he lined them up that day. Made me think of the day that Jesse pulled out all his sons. Lined them up there in front of Samuel. And Samuel's come to anoint one of them as king. They're being brought up before. I'll tell you, I can see Jesse just smiling as the oldest come by. Man, he's got the look as a king. He's got the, he's got the mannerisms of a king. He's got the body build of a king. And, and I can see Jesse, his father, sitting back going, I know, that's my boy right there. That's the one I'm proud of. Nope, that's not him, says the prophet. The next one comes by. Nope, that's not him. Jesse said, well, it's got to be this third one then. Nope, that's not him. Fourth, fifth, sixth, seven sons come by. Nope, not any of those. And Samuel says, the Lord has sent me to your house today, Mr. Jesse, to anoint one of your sons as the king of Israel. He says, are these all your sons? And that's when, oh, I love this. Come on, friend. That's, that's when Jesse says, no, there's still one more. There's still one more. He's out there in the field tending the sheep, he says. See, Jesse was looking at the exterior, but God says, I look at the heart. Our verse, our passage says, do not look at the outward appearance. Verse 7, for man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. David, a king, sin for the youngest one out tending the sheep. David, a king, yeah, right. David ruling God's people, not in a million years. He's a shepherd boy. In ancient Israel, the youngest son 
would be the shepherd boy for the family. So if you're the youngest and mama has another baby, you get, you get promoted up because the youngest son is the shepherd in ancient Israel. And many times when mama and daddy are done having children and that youngest son becomes the shepherd boy for that family, he will be the shepherd boy for the rest of his life because he's out in the fields not going and meeting ladies and starting his own family. Many times the shepherd boy in ancient Israel would, would remain single his entire life. He would live with the sheep the majority of his life. Many times it was a lifetime job. And to keep that shepherd warm, he would dress like the Bible describes John the Baptist dressed. He would dress in camel's hair to keep him warm. He wouldn't live at home like the rest of the family lived at home. He didn't sit down and eat meals at the supper table like the rest of the brothers and the mother and the father sat down and ate meals. He would live in the caves of mountains that surrounded the pastures. And I remember being in Israel and all the mountains seeing caves after caves. There's so many of those caves and that's where David would have lived. He would have smelt like sheep He would because, because listen, being a shepherd is a stinky job. And he'd have that smell on him. And can you imagine Jesse standing there when Samuel says, is there one more? He's thinking, you mean my young living out in the cave, eating his sack lunch, camel wearing, come on now, stinking like a sheep. He can't govern a kingdom. He can't rule a country. He belongs with sheep, placing limitations. Placing limitations. But when that stinky, camel hair dressed, cave living, staff and rod carrying, lowly outcast shepherd boy walked in the room, God said, he is glowing with health and he has a fine appearance and he is the one, glory to God. God said, here's your king. Here's your king. See, Jesse didn't think. David had king potential. Number two, David's brothers did not think he had warrior potential. You remember the story of David and Goliath? Amen? You all know that story. What you may have missed is how David ended up down there on the battleground. We always read and talk about him taking the stone, slingshot, Taking the giant out. But what's the shepherd boy doing on the battleground? He's not a warrior. Remember, David's brothers did not think that he had warrior potential. The reason he was down there is because he was that. He was the youngest son, tending the sheep, kind of like a gopher as well for the family. And Jesse said to David, he said, David, I want you to go check on your brothers down on the battleground. Go see how they're doing, how they're faring, and I want you to take them some sandwiches. Made them some grilled cheese sandwiches. <laughs> I preached a message once called, Who Will Carry the Stinking Cheese? Because everybody in the church wants to take out giants, but who's going to be faithful in the little things and carry the cheese sandwiches that set you up for the big things? The Word says if you're faithful in the little things, He'll make you ruler. Come on now, church. So he's just doing what his daddy told him to do. He's not thinking he's big and bad. He's not even feeling like he's a warrior at this point. He just leaves the sheep for a little bit, gets the sandwiches, takes a little journey to go check on his brothers. And I want you to go to chapter 17. Skip a chapter. Go, go to the next chapter and look at verse number 28. The Bible says First Samuel 17, verse 28 says that when David's oldest brother heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You come down only to watch the battle. Now listen to David's oldest son. Listen to what he's saying. David shows up with these sack lunches. And his oldest, his oldest brother, David's oldest brother, begins to shout out things like, What are you doing here? Go back and play your little harp in the field. 
Go back and pet your little sheep. You have no business here. Go run off your little wolves and get away. This is serious business. You're not a warrior, David. (laughs) If only he knew at that time. How many times I've been told, oh, you can't do that. You're too young for that. You're not a warrior. Oh, if you only knew. (laughs) I was told that when the pulpit committee was looking at Crystal and I as their pastors, that when we had the phone interview with the entire committee over the phone, everybody sitting in Steve and Linda Sunwall's home and I think Steve was doing the interviewing from one room and everybody else was listening from the speaker from another room. And uh, I was told a few days after that that when we were doing that interview that the anointing of God come down in that house that day and the Holy Spirit's presence because I got a call a few days later and they asked, did you feel the Spirit of God like we felt the Spirit of God when we were talking to you on the phone? And I said, I sure did. And they said, man, the Lord just moved. And somebody, I think Lena told me not too long ago, she said, when that, when that phone interview, when, when that hung up, when we hung up the phone, see, see, on my side when I hung up the phone, I thought, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I'm young. I mean, I know I I've pastored, but but this is this is Trinity Assembly of God in Little Rock, and they're probably looking for someone. I was placing limitations, probably looking for someone a little older, someone a little more experienced, somebody that's, that's been around a little bit longer, somebody that kind of knows the ropes a little bit more. I'm placing these limitations, and I'm thinking that what I didn't know is that when the phone hung up on this side here in Little Rock, that Nancy Hastings shouted out. She said, "Go get him! Whatever you gotta do, go get." him is what somebody told me see I'm on my side placing limitations but on this side somebody had the spirit of the Lord that saw in the prophetic that this is the one that God has chosen for such a time as this I'm telling you friend God is able through his spirit to break down every limitation my 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 I preached Wednesday night on the cost of the anointing How many of you are here for it? And how when you're chosen and you're anointed by God, anybody chosen and anointed by God in the house today? Well, seven or eight of you, okay. When you are chosen and anointed by God, people, I said this Wednesday night, they will misunderstand your motives. Remember, David's down there just out of obedience to his father. And his brother says, what in the world are you doing down here? You're prideful, you're arrogant, you think you're some kind of warrior, you're nothing. You're a nobody. And as I said Wednesday night, people will misunderstand your motives, even as David's brothers accused him of pride and improper motives. This is something you need to learn today, friend, especially those of you that are in ministry and serving the Lord and that have been chosen and anointed by God. You need to learn this today from your pastor You need to learn that people will misunderstand your motives. And hear me today. You can have the purest motives in the world and people will misunderstand you. You can be as pure as heart in your motives. Right, everything in right order between you and God. And people will misunderstand why you do what you do and why you say what you say. Come on, somebody. And I shared Wednesday night, and I want to share it with you. Here's some reasons why people will misunderstand your motives. You ought to write this down. It's going to help you. It's going to help you someday if it doesn't help you today. Number one is self-justification. Write that down, self-justification. People will misunderstand your motives due to self-justification because they are unwilling to pay the price for the cost of the anointing. Oh, y'all aren't hearing me today. People will, people will criticize you. People will make fun of you. People will tell you, you know, you're. here's why. Because they're not willing to pay the price for the anointing that you're carrying on your life. People will sit back and say, well, you know, Alex and Carmen, they're already pastors. They ain't even been saved and married very long. And now they're pastors in the church. You know, they're pastors got them on the team and they're leading young adult ministry and 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 listen to me you don't know the cost of the anointing on their life 
You don't know what they've gone through. What they Listen, they left family years ago not knowing, thinking it was for secular work, not knowing God had a bigger picture for them. You don't know the price they pay. Listen, nobody knows what it's like when you're in the ministry and you've got to be home and all your family somewhere else because you've got to be there on Sunday. You've got to be there to, 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 to minister to your flock, John. Y'all, y'all couldn't even go home for Thanksgiving because you, you had to be there. See, people don't understand the cost of the anointing, but but listen to me. So for self-justification, they'll sit back because they're not willing. They're not willing, so it's easier just to point a finger at someone that is and bring them down. Listen, David's older brother had no intentions of bringing that giant down. He was too afraid. So instead of just saying, David, we've got a real problem here, he turns it on David. That's self-justification. Here's another reason. one: Those whose views are determined by human reasoning. That means the carnal mind rather than the spirit's guidance. They're not spiritual people, so they're not going to understand. Some of you in ministry and serving the Lord in the church and being faithful and doing what God's called you to do, you'll have family that will not understand why you do what you do for the Lord because they're carnal. Another thing that I see probably more than anything this is, this is one reason people will misunderstand your motives and they will criticize you over and over again when you walk in a David type of anointing. And that is because they've lost their own zeal and their own passion for the Lord. So it's easier just to criticize you and your passion than for them to deal with their lack of passion. One of the most passionate soul winners that I know is Colin Cox's dad. Kelly Cox, a lot of you know him. Passionate. He wants to see people get to heaven probably more than anybody I personally know. I'm telling you, he wants to pull them out of hell and he'll do everything he can. To the point, I've seen him, he does it almost every weekend. He'll stand on the street corners of concerts, witnessing and preaching the gospel. Like they did in the Bible, standing out in the street market and lifting up their voice and preaching the gospel. But he's also one of the number one people I see criticized for his style and his approach. And the world's not criticizing him. It's the church. It's the religious, idiotic, pharisaical. Yes, I get a little upset with religious folk. So did Jesus. It's the church that will say, well, you know, those approaches don't really work. When they say that, I want to say, well, what are you doing? What are you, who have you won? You've been sitting on the pew for 45 years. You ain't brought some one person to church. And you're going to sit there and criticize somebody that spends their Friday and Saturday nights preaching Jesus crucified, that he died and he rose again. Give me a break. That's what I mean. I'm telling you, that's what, listen, you're going to deal with this. You're going to deal with this. That's why I'm preaching the way I'm preaching. You're going to deal with it. Some of you, you're on the brother side. I see it in your eyes this morning. You know who you are. You've been the criticizer. You've been the one placing limitation. You've been the one sitting back not doing anything for the kingdom. And you found it easier just criticizing those who are passionate about the kingdom. I deal with it with older preachers in the ministry all the time. They'll say, oh, I know you. I hear you got a little fire in you. Enjoy it while it lasts because one day you'll get older like us. You'll calm down like I did. Your church will calm down like ours did. (laughs) Y'all fire me if it ever happens. Well, you can't fire me, but if you could, it'd be good. I'm telling you, friend, you'll deal with it. Because there's a lot of church people that have grown weary in their own battle and their spiritual zeal. And that's what's happening here with David. Has anyone ever placed limitations on you? You know when that happens, what it's time to do? It's time to show up for battle. I said it's time to show up for battle. Don't let limitations placed on you keep you from being what God has called you to be. Don't fear and run away. If I allowed everybody that tried to limit me as a pastor, this would be my 731st church to pastor. If I run away from every church that tried to limit me, this would, I'd, be, I'd be pastoring one every Sunday. Be a new pastor every week. 
I'd start on a Sunday morning, resign at the end of the service, start another one next Sunday. <laughs> no, when limitations are placed on you, it's time to go to battle. That's what David did. You see how David responded? Remember David and Goliath? He didn't look at his oldest brother and go, you're right, I'm just a shepherd. I need to just get back up home and just get back out with the sheep. No, he hung around a little bit. <laughs> He checked it out. He come up with a plan. And he went to battle. Is there anybody in this place ready to go to battle? <laughs> Write this down. Limitations can only limit you if you allow them to. I don't care what people say about you, try to put on you, say you can't do or you can't be. Only limit you if you allow them to. And that's why he said, let's take on that giant. Let's take on the giant. Come on, somebody. A lot of giants living all around us. Because we don't think we can overcome them and conquer them. It's time to go to battle. Number three, King Saul did not think David had champion potential. Everyone say champion potential. Jesse didn't think David had king potential. His brothers didn't think he had warrior potential. Now King Saul. Oh, King Saul. King Saul didn't think that David had champion potential. Look at chapter 17 again. Look down at verse 31. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul. And Saul sent for him. Now pause and look up here just a second. David had just stepped back, delivered the grilled cheese sandwiches, and he said, I think we can bring this giant down. I mean, I've been out there in the pastures and running off wolves and bears and all types of critters in the night with just a little stone and a sling. That's how they do it. Let me release that. He said, I've, I've seen him drop over dead. I mean, with the help of the Spirit of the Lord. <laughs> I, I, I feel like if God would just guide my swinging and let that stone be released at the exact perfect time. And if the Spirit of God could just guide that stone and implant it into the giant's head, I don't think we're going to have a problem anymore. Mm -hmm. I love David he's my second favorite Jesus first David second the Lord gave me the name David he never has called me Dwayne he's always called me David all my life my mama named me wrong God calls me David my second favorite place to see when I went to Israel first was of course the empty tomb Woo, glory to God Something about that empty tomb. But my second favorite place was a tomb with a body in it, David's body. Had to put on the little Jewish cap. You know, they make you wear that thing. I was like, look at me, man. And I walked in there thinking, I'm going to a tomb. Woo! <laughs> the cloud was there. Some of you saw that picture when I walked out. I couldn't believe the picture myself when I looked at the picture of me when I come out of that room. That somebody took, or maybe I selfied it myself, I don't know. But when I looked at the picture, I thought, that's the glory of God on my face. I'm telling you, there's something about David when he said, You come to me with a spear, but I come to you. In the name of the Lord God Almighty. He examined the situation. He said, guys, I think we can take care of this giant. Remember, King Saul didn't think he had champion potential. But, but read on. Look, look, verse 31 says, it says here that when David, what David saw, said was overheard and reported to Saul, Saul sent for him. Somebody went to Saul. <laughs> you won't believe this kid. He thinks he, mm -hmm. David said to Saul, verse 32, Let no man lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight for him. Your servant will go and fight. 
And Saul replied, you are not able. Oh my, limitations. Are y'all with me today? I said, are y'all with me today? He said, he said you, you are not able. You can't do it. You can't go out and fight this Philistine. He says in verse 32, you are only a young man. And he's been a warrior from his youth. Is that what the Bible says? I said, is that what the Bible says? But David knew he could conquer. He could fight and conquer Goliath. He knew he was a champion. But, but Saul placed limitations on him. And the two listened is number one, you're too young and you're too inexperienced. He's been doing this since he was a kid. You, you haven't been doing it at all. Too young and too inexperienced. Can I tell you today, I thank God for spirit-filled people who have seen potential. I thank God for David's people that can see into the spirit. I thank God for all them pastors that opened their pulpit up to me when I was 16 and 17 years old, allowing me to preach when I didn't know what I was doing. I was too young and too inexperienced. But I was able to see many, many miracles as a young man because somebody opened their pulpit. I thank God for when I was 19 years old, Pastor John, I got a call to come down to Glad Tidings Assembly of God in Springfield, Missouri. I was in Bible college. Pastor wants to meet with you. I come down. I, they take me to his office. Walk in. I sit down. This spirit-filled man, he looks at me and he says, Brother B, Walter Bashir, he, he looks at me and he says, Well, listen, I'm just going to cut to the chase here. God spoke to me. You're supposed to be my youth pastor. I'm offering you a job. I looked at him and said, I don't like youth. He said, you are one. I said, I don't like them. I said, I don't like teenagers. I said, I want to do youth ministry. I said, I'm not called. I said, I'm called to be an evangelist. I'm not going to youth pastor and I'm not going to pastor. I said, there, there is no youth ministry heart in me at all. He said, well, you need to pray about it and get back to me. I said, well, I will. That was a lie. <laughs> I said it, I will. I had no intentions of praying about it. Some of you in the ministry, you know what I'm talking about. I had no intention. I left his office, I thought, that guy's crazy. Says God told him, that guy has lost his mind. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. I'm walking in the parking lot, Robert. I took my hand, and I went to open my door. And the minute my hand opened the doorknob of my car, I heard the Lord say, this is where I've called you. I've chosen you and anointed you for this purpose. Oh, some of y'all tired and all ready to go home. You're all ready to go home. Well, we don't have church tonight. No church tonight. I know it's the first Sunday, but no church tonight. That means I get to preach double time. Amen. Amen. Plus, I didn't preach last Sunday, so that's like triple time. Amen. Yes, it's, it's, it's growing. It's getting bigger and bigger. And I got in my car and I drove off. I come back to meet with them. I said, you know what? I, I feel that. I feel you're right. God spoke to my heart, too. I'm supposed to be the youth pastor here. I said, but I'll be honest with you. I don't know a thing about youth ministry. I, I don't even know how to do it. I don't even know where to start. I said, I preach like the same messages all the time. I don't write a new one every week. I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what to do. I, I, you know, I wanted to tell him I don't like kids, you know, I wanted him to know. He said, well, I'll tell you what, he was just, this is how he was. This is just how the pastor, this is how he was. He said, well, here's the deal. He said, there's seven teenagers in our youth ministry here. Seven. There's seven teenagers. He said, you have one job, and you have a year to do it. He said, fill that gym up with teenagers. That's what he told me. I've told this story. You know this story. He said, fill the gym. It was a gym. Full court gym. He said, fill it up. He said, if you don't fill it up in a year, you're fired. That's what he told me. When I was hired, he told me how I'd get fired. <laughs> That's how he was. He didn't sweet talk. He didn't pay package talk. He didn't. He said, this is what we can pay you. This is all we got. And you're going to have to clean some toilets and commodes too while you're here. You've been in youth ministry, Tony. You know what I'm talking about. Youth pastors get to do a lot, don't they? 
He said, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna sweep when I need you to sweep? <laughs> and you're going to do everything I don't want to do is basically what he told me. <laughs> and he said, you got, but one thing you are going to do, you're going to fill that gym up. He said, if you don't, you're fired. Man, I left out there thinking, I'm scared to death because I only got a year here. There ain't no way I can fill that gym up. Oh, y'all getting it now. Y'all getting it. Y'all getting it over here. Heard someone say limitations. Yes, hallelujah. That's right. First week, we had those seven kids. John wasn't even in the youth ministry yet. Seven kids. My second Wednesday night, we had four. I'm like, yes, at this rate, I'll be out in a month. <laughs> Seven to four. We're going down to one next week. I'm gone by week four. It's over. Youth ministry days are behind me. Yes. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. Except for I was chosen and anointed. God said, go to the schools. We sat at the corners of the schools at three o'clock. When that bell rang, we sat on the other side of the street, on the street corners of middle schools. When them kids started walking home, we started grabbing them, introducing ourselves, and introducing them to Jesus. And it was my wife standing on a street corner who came face to face with a little, what grade were you in? Six, fifth, sixth grade. A sixth grader walking across from his, Reed Middle School was the name, and then runs right in the pathway of my wife, and she stops him, and she starts to introduce him to Jesus, probably not getting his attention with that, so he said, she starts, she starts filling him out, she's filling him out, she's like, you like to play basketball? He said, oh, I love basketball. She says, we got a full court gym, why don't you come down on Wednesday nights, we start service at 7, if you'll come early, we'll open the gym, you can play basketball in there, and we get free pizza, oh yes, filling him out, filling him out. I think he was there that Wednesday night and he became one of our greatest students and student leaders in our youth ministry and now is our youth pastor at Tag Church. But the same devil that put those limitations in my mind that you can't do it. And by the way, that youth group exploded, didn't it? I wouldn't say we technically filled the gym, but within a few months we're, we had hundreds of kids walking through our Friday night lives and our services. And we were able to stay there almost four years as youth pastors of that church. But the same devil that tried to put limitations in my mind will do it on you too. You can't preach. You've never wrote sermons. You don't know how to do this. You, don't, you just tell them, get behind me, devil, because there's a champion inside of me and you're about to see it you're about to see the champion 24 years old God says go and pastor your first church I said no I'll do that when I get old pastors are old you don't meet young pastors they all old they all are old I said, and that's what I told the Lord I said pastors are old you got the wrong person <laughs> yeah, you know how that works, don't you? But I'm going to tell you, God anointed me. He called me. Today, friend, I'm telling it to you for this reason. There's a champion inside of you. God's chosen you and he's anointed you for a purpose. It may not be to pastor a youth ministry. It may not be to preach behind a pulpit. But he's called you to a purpose. And there's a champion inside of you. And you need to overcome every limitation and be all that God has called you to be. I got to move quick. I got to move quick. I want to say this real fast because I mentioned this Wednesday night, and everybody take notes and listen with your ears real fast because I'm going to say it. I'm going to I'm going to move through it quick, but I, I feel like it needs to be repeated from Wednesday night. As I said, I preached Wednesday night on the cost of the anointing and how when you're chosen and anointed by God, people will not only will they misunderstand your motives, as I mentioned a moment ago, but people will also become jealous. Hear me, of your success and God's blessings on your life. If you go over a chapter to 1 Samuel chapter 18 and look at verse number 6, the Bible says that when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, he killed that giant, the women came out of all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing and with joyful songs and with tambourines and they danced and they sang, listen to their song, these women are out there dancing with tambourines. They're shouting and they're singing. The Philistines come down. We're victorious in battle. Listen to, their, listen to the lyrics of this song. 
Saul has slain a thousand. David has slain 10,000. And just like an old Pentecostal chorus that keeps repeating itself, Saul has slain a thousand, David slain ten thousand, Saul slain a thousand, David slain ten thousand. Saul, you got a thousand, but David got ten thousand. Saul, you're pretty good, but David's a lot better. Saul, you were victorious, but you ought to see David. You think you've got it going. You ought to see what he's got going. And and no, 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 my, 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 my. Don't, 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 don't. Verse 8, Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. I'm reading out the Bible. (laughs) They, and here's what Saul says. They have credited him with tens of thousands, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Some of y'all are with me. What more could he get but the kingdom? Look at verse 9. It's so important. And from that moment on, Saul kept a close eye on David is what the Bible says. Watched him. Watched him. Go down to verse 29. Same chapter. Chapter 18, verse 29. Saul became still more afraid of him, of David, and he remained his enemy the rest of his days. Y'all getting this? Saul became jealous of the recognition that David received from the time he killed Goliath. Why? Because Saul stood powerless over that giant, over that enemy that David killed with a stone. I'm talking to you about jealousy today in ministry and in service. You know what the root is? One of the biggest ones where jealousy springs up in ministry and in churches. I'm jealous over your blessing, over your ministry. Your ministry's growing, mine's not. 10,000, 1,000. Here it is. Write it down. Personal insecurity. Look at verse 8. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They've credited David with thousands. But look what it says. It says he thought. He didn't say it. He's not talking to somebody. This is what's going through his mind. Man, they're crediting David with tens of thousands. Me with only a thousand. Personal insecurity. You've been chosen, anointed by God. Be careful. There'll be people around you. There'll be Saul's. Because they deal with insecurity. And those who become jealous, listen, this isn't anything new. How many of you give me a few more minutes? I tell you, every week they put that sermon on the website and I see the time on it. I'm like, my Lord, who would sit and listen to me that long? And then some days I'm having a bad day and I turn myself on and it gets better. So I, I mean, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But <laughs> this, <laughs> this, <laughs> usually it'll get worse. Amen. Uh, this isn't anything new. What we're talking about isn't anything new. Those that follow Jesus around, his disciples, they dealt with the same stuff. And Jesus addressed it in Luke chapter 9. He dealt with two things. Jesus dealt with a comparative spirit and a comparative spirit. Did y'all hear me? Because they all sitting around competing. I wonder which one of us will be the greatest in the kingdom of God. <laughs> You waiting for it. No one likes a dry preacher. I said this Wednesday night, that's like me and Dennis sitting around, you know, sitting around. Well, you know, Dennis, I'm sure I'll be at the right hand and, you know, greater in the kingdom because I am the lead pastor. Dennis says, yeah, but, you know, you're just a kid. I mean, I have been here and been a member here and been serving here faithfully. Been serving the Lord really longer than you've been alive, (laughs) Pastor. So, I mean, the Lord's looking at, you know, I mean, that's what we do, don't we? That's what people do. They compare. And Jesus dealt with the comparative spirit, didn't he? 
He said, you all nothing. Unless you become like one of these little kids, you'll not even get there. And then he deals with what? Not, not only the competitive spirit, but the comparative spirit. They come to him right in the same verse, the next verse, Susie. One verse, they're, <laughs> one verse they're stinking, competing with one another. And the next verse, they're comparing. Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> you know, if you're ever having a bad day, read the disciples. These guys were so messed up, it'll make you feel so much better about yourself. <laughs> if you're ever thinking you're not going to make heaven because you're so messed up, look at the disciples. <laughs> you can be like any of them but Judas and you'll be okay. Jesus, Jesus, we saw a man casting demons out in your name, and he's not one of us. Jesus, we saw a man laying hands on the sick in your name. He's not one of us. What do you want us to do? Peter says, I've got my sword. We'll go chop his head off. <laughs> Jesus says, huh? If they're not against you, they're for you. Whoever's not against you is for you is what he said. I got to finish. I got to finish. How do you respond to that? You respond by allowing God himself to, val or to vindicate your ministry. It's God who gave you the king potential. It's God who gave you the champion potential. It's God who gave you the warrior potential. You've got to allow God to do it. Now listen, another way you can do it, and this, is, this, is, this, is, this isn't from the Bible. can't give you chapter and verse. This is from my mama's lips that I heard all my life. Be the better person. Come on, mamas. I thought I'd at least get an amen out of you. Be the better person. Be the better person. Be the better person. Because now David is running for his life. Because Saul's trying to kill him. In this context of scripture, Saul wanted to put him in a battle that would guarantee his death. And Saul wanted to have him killed. Saul was making attempts to take his life, David's life, because of that jealousy, that insecurity. And David's running for his life. On our way to the Dead Sea, we went through En Gedi. The tour guide pointed out the caves and the mountains, and he said that's where David, one of those caves he would have hid when he was running from Saul. Saul pursued him, the Bible says, went after him. Saul stopped to go inside a cave, here's what your Bible says, to relieve himself. They didn't have quick stops on the corner. So they went into a cave to relieve themselves on the journey to look for David. Providence of God. He just happened to stop at the cave that David and his men were hiding deep in. Ain't that God? And he went in. Sorry. I know we're in mixed company, but this is what the Bible says. And he's relieving himself. And as he's doing it, checkmate, checkmate, <laughs> checkmate. Saul hears him, or David hears him, somebody in the cave. And David secretly and quietly goes through and comes up right behind Saul. Those of you that were Wednesday night here, and David took his sword. How many of you read this in the Bible? You've read it in the Bible. He takes his sword out and he sneaks up behind Saul and he chops his head off. Oh, is that not what it says? Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong story. I'm thinking Goliath. <laughs> I know what it was. He sneaks up behind him. Whoo, chops his ear off. That's what it was. 
Oh, that was Peter. That's right. <laughs> Peter. So I told the Wednesday night crowd, shh, because I wanted to test everyone else's Bible knowledge tonight. Now the Bible says he come up and chopped off a corner of his coat. Took it in his hand. David said, I could have taken your life. I could have taken your life. You want to be a champion? You can get revenge if you want to. You can be ugly just like they're being ugly to you. You can talk about them just like they're talking about you. Or you can be a champion. And David said, I could have taken your life. But you're my king. And God chose you and he's anointed you. And David even ran out and followed him out. And Saul left. He left the cave. And David ran out, chased him. And fell to his feet. Fell to his knees. And said, I'll honor you. As long as you're God's chosen and God's anointed. David was the better person. Saul was going to kill him. David spared his life and could have took it. Amen. Worship team, will you make your way to the platform, please? You need to read that in 1 Samuel 18. It's a great story. I read it quite often. There's one thing that King James says that the NIV does not say in that chapter. Talking about being the better person. NIV's language is weak there. The King James is perfect. It says this, and I quote from the King James Version. Forget what verse, it's in chapter 18 of 1 Samuel. It says this, And David behaved himself wisely. Perfect. Perfect. Could have killed him that day, but behaved himself wisely. As the worship team comes and is getting in place and ready to play, I want to close and finish today. I had one more point, and I'm not going to preach it just because of time. I'll save it for another time. I'll give it to you if, you want to, if you're taking notes and you want to write it down. I'll go ahead and give it to you, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to preach it. The last point was to bring up Goliath, that Goliath did not think that David had opponent potential. If you remember, Goliath was mocking him. Who are you? But David comes in the name of the Lord. And today I want to say this to us. When that giant fell, when the giant fell, and David walked up to that giant laying on the ground, I don't know, I guess I'd have to reread it again to see what it says exactly. I guess our minds just kind of picture the stone killed him and he died. I, I don't know, maybe the Bible says exactly what happened. I'd have to reread it to know. But whether he fell dead or he just fell over, David come up. Remember, he didn't have a sword. He knocked him over with a stone. He took Goliath's sword, the Philistine sword. And your Bible says, yes, the beautiful, lovely, poetic Bible that we think Jesus is just so nice and charming all the time, says this champion, this opponent, took the sword of the Philistine and cut his head off and it does say that not only that it says he reached down and grabbed the hair and picked that head up and walked all the way back to Jerusalem with it Can you? we walked we, we were on those hillsides carrying that head back got into the city look what the Lord has done that's a king. That's a warrior. 
That's a champion. 